Many of you will remember this advert. It claims that you can use a ZX80 to run a power plant. Now folklore suggests that the power plant should be a nuclear one, but to be honest it's a little vague in detail. I first saw this advert back in 1980 in the wireless, March edition of the Wireless World. Now I was 21 years old at the time and I was very fond of Clive Sinclair's products uh, and his often over enthusiastic marketing. But this was different though. So I thought I'd investigate further. Now I don't actually have a working ZX80, um, nor a power plant, nuclear or otherwise come to that. So we'll just have to improvise. So if you want to see how you can control a nuclear power plant using one of these, stay tuned. Okay, so we have a computer. Uh, what we need now is a nuclear power plant, and I guess they're tricky to get hold of. Now, I did check eBay, which is what I usually do when I'm stuck for things, um, but to be honest, um, there's not too much about. Although I did find this, uh, but it's collect only, and it's probably a bit too large for me anyway. What I do have is a small amount of uranium-238, but more about that later. As I don't have a nuclear reactor, I thought the best thing to do was to model one in software. Now, as luck would have it, our son designs these things for a living, and so I have the maths I need to, to create the, the model. Um, and as I think of myself as a bit of a coder, I don't expect that to be too much of an issue. What I need is some decent hardware to run it on. Now, I've got an 8-core Linux box under my desk over there, which is a potential uh, solution. And I also have a 28-core uh, ARM cluster based on um, a load of Raspberry Pis bolted together. So we could possibly use that. But I like a challenge. So I decided that if a ZX80 was powerful enough to control a nuclear power plant, then a ZX81 should be powerful enough to control it and model it at the same time. So what we have here is a ZX81, which provides a reasonable, albeit simplified, model of a nuclear power plant. Um, we have our uh, reactor here. We have our generator, steam generator here, which is uh, powering a turbine, generating at the moment 0.75 gigawatts. This is a one gigawatt power plant. So this is uh, running at 75% its normal power. Uh, we have a condenser here as well. So down here we have details of reactivity and temperatures and I'll show how these components interact in a minute. Now nuclear power and reactors are actually fairly simple to understand at least at a high level. So here we have the reactor where the chain reaction takes place um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Now the reactor is full of water uh, because of this nuclear reaction it gets very hot, um, very hot. Now this is pumped through a steam generator uh, which heats up some different water which turns to steam that steam turns the turbine. Now the turbine is connected to an electrical generator which generates our electricity. Um, now in this design, the water in the reactor never mixes with the water in the steam turbine. Um, it just, it's just kind of a heat exchanger, so this one heats up that water. Um, now this third loop in our example would typically bring cold water in from the sea, uh, helping to cool the system down before passing it back through a cooling tower or something like that. In each loop there are pumps circulating the water and here they are here. Now in our ZX base model there are four in the primary loop, two in each of the other loops and we'll see what happens when some of these fail later. Now this piece of uranium bought on eBay, although to be honest it could be a fake, although when I open the lid all the cameras go off so who knows. Um, but this is typical of what's found naturally, this is uranium-238 with about well less than 1% uranium-235. Uranium-238 and Uranium-235 are radioactive with an extremely long half-life. That means they're still around from when the Earth was first created. Now reactors such as the one we have here requires a little bit more Uranium-235 than is found naturally in the Uranium on Earth. Now the reason for this is that Uranium-238 can't support a chain reaction whereas Uranium-235 can. With a process called enrichment, we can get the uranium-235 content up to about 3 to 5%, which would be enough to use as our nuclear fuel. If a uranium-235 atom was to absorb a lone meandering neutron, it would become uranium-236, which is very unstable. And immediately, this would split into two more stable atoms, which generates a lot of heat, and it's that heat that heats up our water. The really neat thing is that splitting the atom also creates some spare neutrons, which, if we can slow them down enough, could be used to split another uranium-235 atom. This generates more heat and some more spare neutrons, and so it goes on, a chain reaction. Slowing down the neutrons is key. The 
Turns out water is extremely good for slowing neutrons down, which is pretty handy because that's what our reactor is filled with. We call this the moderator. To control the thing, we have some control rods. These things are made of neutron absorbing material so that instead of neutron splitting atoms, they get absorbed by the rods instead. And it's this that allows us to control the reactivity of the reactor. Reactivity can be controlled in other ways, such as the concentration of boric acid in the water. Anyway, we'll just be using the control rods today. Another thing that's really neat about the pressurized water reactor is that as the water gets hotter, it becomes worse at slowing down neutrons. So as the thing heats up, the reactivity is reduced and more of the neutrons escape rather than splitting more uranium atoms. Now, this has a stabilizing effect, which we'll see in a minute. Now, some reactors, such as the ones at Chernobyl, use graphite as a moderator rather than the coolant water, which meant that as the water heated up, the moderator continued to function normally and the reaction just kept happening at the same rate. Now, our reactor is much safer. As the hotter the water gets, the more the reaction is subdued. The other thing that's in our favour is that at Chernobyl, they weren't using a Sinclair machine like we are. OK, so let's have a closer look at the software. Now, it will run on a standard 16K machine. Um, However, I fitted 16K internally uh, on this machine, so I don't need that. It's also had the power regulator swapped for a switch mode unit. Uh, nuclear reactors get quite hot, so this should help. I've also done a quick and dirty mod for a composite video. Um, and at some point, I'll come back to this to neaten it up. Although these are modern mods for an, an old machine, uh, it still represents a ZX81 with 16K of RAM and ZX81 performance. Um, albeit without the RAM pack wobble issues. Um, although if it was 1981 and I was serious about controlling a nuclear reactor, I'd obviously be using extra blue tack anyway, so I don't expect the RAM wobble would be much of an issue. Currently the power plant is running at 75% of its normal capacity and is said to be critical or at criticality. Now criticality refers to the state where there's a nice balance such that reactivity is neither increasing or decreasing. Now this can be seen here. This gauge shows the change in reactivity, either positive or negative. Now if we switch to panel 2, pressing the 2 key, we can see the reactivity uh, in uh, units of P, uh, and we get the same graphs down the bottom here. Uh, and there's our power output there. Now down here we have uh, required power as a percentage of the maximum power. As I said, it's 1 gigawatt, so 0.75 works out to be 0.75 of a gigawatt. OK, so let's increase the power to 100% and watch the reactivity. Now using the cursor keys, I simply have to increase the required power to 100%. If we look at the actual power setting, we can see that the control system is actually changing the rods at 1% per minute. So let's look at the reactivity with each change. Uh, in order to see this properly, we need to slow things down a bit. So I've captured the session so I can do just that. Uh, and I'll explain what's happening. Now if I just pause it here, now the reactivity due to a control rod change increases as we've pulled them out a bit. Uh, this allows more neutrons to split the uranium atoms and generate more heat in the water. Now if we continue a little and stop it again, the increased temperature of the water has a negative impact on reactivity. Remember that as the water gets hotter, the faster the neutrons travel and the harder it is for them to be absorbed by uranium. Now this is shown here. Now there's also some reactivity in relation to the fuel indicated here. However, the total reactivity is positive and our reactor is said to be super critical. If we continue, we can see that after a period, this all balances out and we end up back in a stable state again. In other words, we reach criticality again. Now this activity repeats at each change of the control rods until we get to our desired power setting. Now the various temperatures are shown here, and their abbreviations are here. I've just changed to screen 2, we can see these temperatures uh, in degrees centigrade. Now at the moment everything is, is working fine, the coolant system is working, uh, the control system is ensuring that we're not changing the rods too quickly, uh, and increasing the reactivity too much. The ZX81 is actually controlling things, that's what we've asked it to do. Uh, in fact it's maintaining power um, at as close to as it can, to the, to the actual requirement, which is 100%, and it's just over one gigawatt. As I mentioned before, each loop has pumps, which uh, circulating pumps, which keep the water circulating. Um, 
Now in terms of cooling, um, there are two things in play here. The first is the thermal conductivity, in other words the ability for the heat to transfer from one loop to another. Um, the second thing is the temperature gradient, in other words the difference in temperature between one and the other. Now if we have a large difference in temperature, then heat will flow. If conductivity is improved, then we don't need such a large gradient for the same heat to flow. Why am I telling you all this? Well, because I know you're not going to be happy until you see a meltdown. Now, uh, thermal conductivity is dependent on the flow of water in each of the loops. So if a pump fails, thermal conductivity is reduced and things will get hotter in the loop. But there's a bit more to it than that. So let's see what happens when we turn a pump off. OK, switching to the pump screen, let's turn off a pump in the third loop. OK, so we've turned off pump G. OK, let's just go back to the main screen. Now we have a pump failure in this loop and as thermal conductivity is reduced, this loop will heat up. As the gradient between these two loops changes, the difference between the temperature there and the now higher temperature here, this means that this loop will start to get hotter because less heat will be able to be transferred to this loop. The same applies here, the water in this loop will get hotter and the gradient between that loop and that loop will be reduced and therefore less heat will be transferred to here. So this will also get hotter. Now there's also some delayed heat from the fuel which we can't really control. Let's just switch to panel 2. Reactivity is reduced and that's simply because of the hotter temperatures. But steam is still being produced and so we still get an output, albeit reduced slightly. However, we have an alarm to worry about. Now we have an alarm code 2 showing which indicates a coolant pump failure. Now let's switch back to the main screen. Now the water here is pressurised such that the boiling point is around 345 degrees centigrade. Now once we get to that, the water starts to boil around the fuel and the coolant no longer does its job properly. Now the fuel temperature just keeps rising and we're in for a meltdown. Now the only thing to do is to perform a scram, an emergency shutdown. We can do this by quickly dropping the control rods and hope they shut the reactor down in time. We can perform a scram by using the S key. However, um, our system is computer controlled. So hopefully the system will implement the shutdown for itself. So let's remove another couple of pumps. So I've just removed pump A from the primary loop. Uh, and let's do another one. Let's do one from uh, loop 2 as well. So I'll press E and we'll switch off loop 2. Let's just go back to screen 2 and watch the temperatures. Things are getting very hot now. And it's at this point I'm pleased that I changed the ZX81 regulator for a switch mode one. OK, things are getting serious and the fuel temperature is running away with itself. So let's see what happens if we do nothing. The system should perform a scram for itself, hopefully averting a meltdown. Now with this reactor, I have the facilities to turn all the safety features off. So let's do that and run the test again. OK, so I've just turned off the safety features with the X key um, and I've turned off three pumps. And as we can see, the fuel temperature is now kind of rising almost out of control. Now, at this point, uh, we should have already had a scram, um, but we haven't because obviously our safety features are turned off. So we're clearly heading for a meltdown. In fact, we've got a stray neutron destroying everything in sight. Now, there are lots of failures we could have modelled. Uh, loss of coolant, uh, removing the rods too quickly and so on, but hopefully you've got the idea. Well it's been a fun exercise and hopefully I've shown at least that ZX81 is quite capable of, of handling some reasonably complex floating point uh, calculations. Um, and whilst it's not particularly responsive, um, that may be something we can deal with going forward. Um, to think that I modelled a pressurised water reactor uh, in 16K and had uh, 111 bytes left and that's pretty cool. Well, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether we validated the advert or not. Uh, maybe you could put something in the comments. So, considering the advert for a minute, why would Science of Cambridge make such a crazy claim in the first place? As I said earlier, I'm very fond of Uncle Clive's products and, and the over-enthusiastic marketing, shall we say. But this felt different somehow. And I think what they were trying to do was to answer what was probably one of the biggest questions of the time. In the late 70s, when homebrew and kit computers started to become popular with electronics hobbyists, most people couldn't understand why anybody would want to pay what was for many a month's salary for a circuit board that didn't really do anything. 
I mean, at the time, it was difficult to imagine what you would do with one of these things in the home. I mean, you could imagine them in a small business or perhaps in car factories or something like that. But in the home, what would be the point? This led to the inevitable question of what do you use it for? Now, this was before the internet, email and the growth of computer games. And it was a difficult question to answer other than suggesting you could do anything, which meant kind of nothing really. Um, now today, it'd be an easy answer. You'd simply say you're trying to learn about computer science or something. However, back then, that wouldn't have made much sense. What was the point of learning about something that had no real purpose? Um, you know, it was like saying that you'd spent all your, all your income on learning about frosted light bulbs. The difference being, of course, that frosted light bulbs were infinitely more useful in the home than a computer. I mean, manufacturers talked of storing recipes, controlling central heating and such like, but let's face it, who was ever going to connect up a cassette player and commandeer the family TV to store a recipe for Flapjack? I mean, it was more far-fetched than controlling a nuclear power station. Of course, a few years later, people started to catch on, especially with the advent of the Computer Literacy Project here in the UK. And adverts started to portray computers as a family activity, at least for a while. But of course, that's another story. So the ZX Reactor software we've got here is by no means a complete, refined uh, product. Um, treat it more as a proof of concept. Nevertheless, I've left a link to a P file and a WAV file, which can be loaded into the various emulators or into a real ZX81. OK, well, that's all for now. Don't forget, if you like the video, press the subscribe button or the thumbs up or both. Uh, and I'll see you next time with some more uh, historic computer nonsense. Take care.